welcome PCS members and friends uh, to today's seminar. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Arul Lakshminarayan uh, to present uh, his recent work. And I would like to invite uh, first our scientific host, uh, Sergei, to introduce our today's speaker. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tilan, and uh, thanks, Arul, for uh, uh, joining us and uh, being ready to present uh, some new results of yours. Let me uh, say a few words about Professor Arul Lakshminarayan. Uh, he did his uh, PhD at uh, Stony Brook uh, in New York in 1993, and then he had uh, various uh, appointments uh, at uh, the Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad. And uh, since 2000, I think three, uh, he uh, is uh, with the IIT in Madras, uh, where he uh, holds a full professorship since 2010. Uh, he had a number of uh, long-term visiting appointments with uh, Washington State University at Pullman, uh, and also with the Max Planck Institute for the Physics of Complex Systems in Dresden, where I think we met first time in 2007. And uh, uh, Arul is an expert in a variety of uh, research topics, which include quantum chaos, quantum information, many body systems and random matrix theory, but not only. Right, and uh, we are very happy that uh, Arul uh, found time today to tell us about his uh, recent results on, and now I just have to switch back uh, to this slide here, the first slide, on a dual unitary to quantum Bernoulli circuits with a very long subtitle, which I will not read right now, but I hope we will understand what it means in just a few minutes. So Arul, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, Sergei, uh, and uh, thanks to Tilen. Thank you very much for the generous introduction and uh, for the really kind invitation. I'm uh, uh, really excited to be here and to talk to you and uh, others have seen the web pages and, um, uh, and the uh, variety of uh, uh, you know, the research topics and the research which is going on there is very exciting and I'm really honored to be able to uh, share some recent work of ours here at uh, IIT Madras. Uh, and uh, this is uh, along with uh, uh, two young colleagues of mine, uh, Arvinda, who is here, is a, is a postdoc with us with a background in quantum foundations, really. And Suhail Ahmad, rather, is a, a PhD student, sort of in the middle of his uh, PhD. Uh, so this is based on a recent work which we posted and it's, uh, it's under uh, review at the moment. So we are all waiting with some anticipation. So um, broadly what I'm going to talk about today is a, a, a sort of a model of many body systems which are non-integrable and uh, quantum chaotic, but are in some sense solvable. And uh, I will uh, say in what precise sense they are solvable and not only that, it's somewhat interesting that they seem to sort of fall into a hierarchy which resembles that of a classical ergodic hierarchy. So the classical dynamical systems, you know, are well known to have an hierarchy, uh, which is called the ergodic hierarchy. And uh, the quantum systems, because of the sort of strange relationship between classical and quantum chaos, Without a, lack, uh, without a phase space and so on, it's not immediately obvious how one connects these things. But these many body systems do seem to be able to, uh, at least in a, a, a somewhat restricted sense, in the sense that it's really in the thermodynamic limit, uh, it, it, we, are, we are able to make connections to very similar quantities uh, like in these classical ergodic systems. So just to remind you of the classical ergodic hierarchy, there are a few important uh, sort of milestones along the way of this ergodic hierarchy, starting at the bottom is ergodic systems themselves and going up, you come to a mixing systems uh, and then going further up Kolmogorov or K systems and then further at the apex, what may be called Bernoulli systems. I will say in more detail what exactly characterizes these uh, uh, these various checkpoints, 
except to say that ergodic is the, just being ergodic is the least in this hierarchy. And the apex of the hierarchy is Bernoulli, wherein actually, although the system is perfectly deterministic, it is in a very rigorous sense also uh, uh, in, a, in a one to one sense uh, isomorphic to completely random processes such as the coin toss. Uh, so the here I've written four stages, same as what I've put here, ergodic, mixing, Kolmogorov, and Bernoulli. And the symbol here means that if we take, let's say a mixing system, a mixing system is guaranteed to be ergodic, but not necessarily Kolmogorov. And similarly, a Kolmogorov system is necessarily mixing, but not Bernoulli, not necessarily Bernoulli. And what we, when we think classically of a chaotic system, we really have in mind Kolmogorov system in which there is positive entropy production, there is uh, the up and off exponents are positive and so on. And as I said, the apex is Bernoulli. So if you have a system which is Bernoulli, it has a positive Lyapunov exponent, it is mixing and it is ergodic. So just to give you a visual uh, sense of this, uh, I'm sure all of you uh, know this very well. Here is an ergodic system, but not a mixing one. So it's just this map on a torus given by this Q and P is in the horizontal and vertical directions. So it's just Q plus square root of two, then P is P plus square root of three, but it is wound on a torus. So things are coming back. So it's ergodic. However, you can see that this particular phase space square uh, consisting of initial points is not spreading at all. So it's definitely not mixing. So the mixing is just as what we would think of putting ink in water and then it mixes. But these are also systems which are conserving measure or area preserving or volume preserving as their Hamiltonian systems are what we have in mind. So here is just to contrast a mixing system, which is a Arnold cat map, it's again, a uh, mapping of a unit torus onto itself, but now it's, uh, it's, it's got a positively up and off exponent and you saw that initial density has now been mixed. It's like the ink has been uniformly mixed in water. So that's an example of mixing system. So it just returns back and you can see again how this mixing happens. So uh, Professor Lakshminarayan, uh, we have a question. Yes, please. Uh, Alexei, please. Uh. Yeah, thank you. I have a very simple question. Could you please go to the previous slides? I mean, the previous map. Um, yeah, I'm just curious, is the absence of mixing uh, by any chance related to the fact that you have um, uh, that you have square root two and square root three? So if instead you take um, transcendental numbers, would that change anything? No, I, it wouldn't because you see that, I mean, the lack of mixing is really because the there is no stretching in phase space. You see this uh, coefficients are really just one and one here. So uh, there is no, uh, there's no stretching. So, so it's, it's, it's just a translation. Same. Okay, yeah. so if you if you just change one to any other number, then immediately would get stretching and it will start mixing. Exactly, but if you just change it to some other number, it may not be area preserving. So you have to see to it that it's area preserving. So may, you may want to do something like 2Q, P by two or something like that, because mm -hmm. you want to keep it in the Hamiltonian context. So in fact, that's what this Arnold cat map does. As you can see, there is this two, but if you take the determinant of this transformation, it is one. Uh -huh. So. Yeah, I see. Okay, so thank you. Yeah. Uh, just again, going back to the example of the ink, the fact that the determinant is one implies that there's no ink created or destroyed. So it's just that the ink is mixing uniformly, but otherwise it's conservative system. Okay, so yes, please free, feel free to uh, stop me uh, at any point. And the, uh, what actually, uh, one of the ways in which to characterize these different stages in the ergodic hierarchy is through the study of correlations. So, uh, the simplest of which to study is two point correlations. So let's take uh, X is here denoting a phase space variable. Now I have in mind some general phase space structure, not necessarily this two dimensional one. And X is a point in this phase space. And F and G are two functions on this phase space. And, uh, uh, and uh, this phi is representing the dynamics on this phase space. So phi T X takes the point X, evolves it for a time T. And uh, this is now the function evaluated at the new point. And we are finding the correlation between 
F evaluated the new point and G evaluated where it is at initial point as a function of time. And then you're looking at the correlation, you would subtract these expectation values. And uh, we have in mind something which is area preserving or volume preserving, or me general measure preserving as I have in mind. And therefore, uh, just the average of f of phi t x will be equal to the average of uh, f of x itself. And these averages are phase space average. Okay, so we have in mind again, like the Hamiltonian system is just the Liouville measure. So, um, so this is the average over the phase space. So that's the definition of a correlation function, a two-point correlation function with these two functions f and g. Uh, well, I'm calling it two because we have just two functions here and there is a time t, which is the observation time. So the decay of these correlations determine whether how mixing it is, whether there is decay and so on. So an ergodic system, which we usually characterize as a phase space average being equal to a time average is completely equivalent to stating that the correlations vanish with time, the average correlations vanish. So you take a time average of these correlations, then that's equal to zero implies that it's an ergodic system. So the average correlation should vanish. If it doesn't vanish on the average, there is some mode which is not decaying, uh, which is not even averaged out to zero, the correlations, then it's non-ergodic. Uh, a mixing system, on the other hand, you don't need to do any averaging over time. If you just wait with time, it's going to go to zero. So in a long time average, it decorrelates. So that is mixing as t goes to infinity. Uh, notice that at this point, we don't say how it is approaching zero. It could be algebraic or exponential. A Kolmogorov system is somewhat uh, difficult. Excuse me, uh, Professor yeah. Lakshmi Narayan. Uh, we have another question from Ihor. Uh, Thank you. Ihor. Yeah. Hello. Uh, so Hi. I want to hear the, about the first statement. Uh, so uh, is that true for any F and G? Because it would seem for any system, uh, be it ergodic or not, if, for example, F is energy and G is momentum, for some oscillators, a uh, system of even ergodic oscillators, there uh, would be non-zero correlations. Just because of the structures of the functions. Um, it, it, you mean if you take some constant functions, functions which are themselves um, uh, 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 constants of motion or something? Yeah, I mean, if you take a constant of motion, then uh, effectively this, uh, this F is not something which is going to change. So let me say that as, as, as we go on in this talk also, you will, you will see that there are uh, sort of, you know, trivial functions which will not decorrelate, but otherwise typically all functions will be, de uh, will be you know, uh, they, they will have some form of uh, decorrelation. De so, uh, so let me say that this, as long as F and G are not themselves constants of motion, uh, there would be a decorrelation in, in your, uh, in this uh, thing. I think because it's uh, easy to make a counterexample. If, uh, for example, F is uh, kinetic energy and G is potential energy. Uh, uh, the sum is conserved and I think then it means that they're strongly correlated. Uh, but on the average, they would still be zero. See, this is an average statement. It's uh, the, the, I mean, the, uh, I mean, the correlations need not vanish, but on the average, it will be zero. So be, there, there'll be positive and negative correlations which are canceling out each other. Um, okay, thank you. I will think about this. Right. Uh, we have another question from Dominic. Sure. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, so I have maybe a more basic question. So I don't understand this correlation function. So what is phi? Why is the phi to the power of t? And what is x? Is x the position or phase point of phase space or what is it? It's a generic phase space point. And phi t x is the phase space point after time t. So it's not a multiplication. It's phi t x is maybe I can actually scribble if taken this. So uh, 
So phi p, let's say at point q p is q at time t, p at time q. Oh, I see. So, so is just, there some is there some reason why there is phi t of x in the first part of this definition and not in the second? I'm just confused. Why is why is it with the f and why is it only in the first part and not like the second part? So the usual so the correlation functions are you know you want to you you want to see how they are decorrelating. So you would you would want to keep one of them to be uh, fixed and the other to be moving around. So, so the, and, and, and then see the correlations between, between these. Uh, so just to give you uh, a sense maybe uh, of, uh, you know, you would, for instance, if you have this, uh, you have some water and then you have mm -hmm. put in this red dye there, you want to see how it is mixing. So you would, you would want to uh, take as your, a and B, let's say that you want to see how much uh, this ink is there in some other region here, okay? Mm -hmm. This region here, let's call this region A, region B. So what you would do, the ink, as you're mixing this uh, ink, this, this A is changing. So this, this A is you know evolving with time, phi T, A. You want to see how much okay. of that is in B. You don't want to, you know, B is some particular region. So you want to see its intersection with B and ask so how the, much of A is in B and so on. So this is a very so similar the, thing. So the yeah. function F uh, represents the region A and function G represents the region B or? Uh, yeah, so you could take, for example, in, in this case, I mean, in, in general, it need not be, uh, but I mean, they could be any functions, but they could also be, uh, characteristic functions on some phase space regions like, like this. So, so it's equal to one if QB okay. belongs to A and it's zero otherwise, for example. So that's, so that's in the, what- In this right-hand side, you know, it just doesn't look very symmetric at all. Uh, so the right-hand side, there's this mean value of Fx. Why is not mean value of F uh, of a fight or, or T X? Yeah, 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 good question. So this, is equal to this. If you wish, you could you could take that, but but this is not uh, not necessary because because this is an invariant measure. So this 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 uh, this phi t is some dynamics, and by this average, one means an av uh, one means a uh, a phase space measure like this. Okay. All oh, right. So, yeah, so when, when you, put you, the dynamics you consider it like it, a it can, it can be taken into Yeah, like, like in this mixing example, which I gave you, uh, the, the volume of uh, the uh, uh, evolved, uh, you know, region A is always equal to the original area or volume. Right, uh, but that's only with Liouville uh, evolution with isolated systems, right? It's not like generally true. So every uh, thing which has a measure preserving transformation. So that's that's what we have in mind. So a Hamiltonian system will have a measure preserving uh, the, mm -hmm. the Liouville measure is the usual measure. But uh, when we are talking about ergodicity, mixing and so on, we have in mind that there is a measure which is conserved. Okay, I think that clarifies it for me. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, we have another question from Dario. Dario, please unmute yourself. Yeah, probably you already, I mean, maybe you already answered it while answering to Dominic, but just to be sure, I mean, can I think about these um, uh, averages as an average over the initial points? Over the initial conditions, let's say? Uh, Mm. Uh, so what, what I have in mind here are, are just functions on phase space. So, yeah. they, so, so it's an average over all phase space. So I mean, if, if, you, if, you, if you had uh, your initial density or something, like for instance, if, uh, if this G of, if, if this F of, uh, F of X, let's say is, as I had in mind this red, a block okay. of ink in that in that example, I would be following the ink. In that case, 
I can do an average over the initial conditions as I'm following the initial condition. Okay, but in general, I'm just doing a whole phase space average. Let me put the question in a different way. Is it possible that on the left-hand side, C depends on X? Uh, no, because we are, we are we're doing an average over all phase space. Okay, but X is, uh, is, I mean, is an initial point that then we evolve. So is it possible that, for example, I have, you know, suppose that I have a phase space in which some, let's say, region is integrable, let's say, and some other region is chaotic. So probably the correlation turn out to be, I mean, if I do a time evolution starting from an X in the integrable part, I will remain, let's say, on a torus. So probably the correlation will be there very different, right? So if I have some islands and so on, so, I mean, I, I, think, I think what you have in mind is that your functions f and g are restricted to parts of phase space. Like, like for instance, your, uh, you know, your, 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 your f could be a delta function at one particular point. Then, obviously, it will depend on that point in which you're taking that. But that's just saying that it depends on the function f. So, okay, but so, if you, okay, so yeah. probably I, I misunderstanding. So, you are doing... A, I mean, in other words, your, uh, your average is uh, integrating over X in the, in the, in the right-hand side? Yeah, absolutely. I see. Ah, okay. Okay, good. Yeah, so, I mean, I have some issue with my iPads, but uh, so let okay. me see. If, okay, okay, uh, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so the average sign means it's an, it's an integral over all of phase space with mm -hmm. that invariant measure. Uh, okay, good. Yeah. We have uh, something more from Dominic. Uh, Dominic, please. Yeah, I have one other question. So, uh, so this ergodicity and mixing depends on F and G, right? So, like no, every time I hate somebody. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It doesn't, it doesn't? depend on F and G. Uh, they are just, uh, I mean, these are properties defined in terms of F and G. But the, the, I mean, if you take some other f and g, you still have to have an average which is going to zero. Still, it's going to exactly going to zero, and so on. Yeah, unless Wait, you so, take some really uh, you know special f and g. So uh, maybe there are some conditions as stated by mathematicians. But so what is the for, what is the statement for ergodicity? Like for uh, any f and g up to measure zero, or it exactly to zero. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that's why we say that uh, the system is ergodic rather than the, uh, you know, the observables are ergodic in the system or whatever you would say. That's right. So, on. I mean, the usual ergodic, uh, is the statement of ergodicity will, will talk about almost everywhere. So that's, that's with respect to, you know, up to sets of measure zero. So, but here I, I just, and I'm not stating it like that. I'm stating it in terms of correlation functions of F and G. So these are just some functions in phase space. So I would say that avoid constants of motion, but otherwise uh, there are any generic functions. Maybe there are some class of functions which are very uh, strange, which uh, okay. I don't know what they are, which, yeah. Oh, so basically for any F and G, which is not a constant of motion, if it is zero for a like the couple of them, it will be zero for any other couple. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Arul, let me just add to that. So the, the uh, time in the uh, line of the ergodic uh, case, T, is uh, any finite time or is it also infinite time only? Uh, infinite time, infinite time. Thanks. It has to so be. So what, what is then the difference between ergodic and mixing? Because in the mixing case, it also goes to zero as t goes to infinity. So yeah, but not average. So without doing a time average. Oh, I see. Zero. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, without, without the which average? Without the time average. Oh, I so, see. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Without doing the infinite time average, it's okay. going to zero. So it's just decaying out to zero. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, actually, I wish I could draw. I don't know why my uh, thing is refuse to stop working. Ah, there it is. I think now I can do it. Yeah, so. Still it's. Um, yeah, uh, Sergey, let me just proceed. Maybe I. Uh, yeah, let's just go on. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, that's good. So, so that's ergodic and mixing. In fact, Kolmogorov does not, systems don't have uh, a, a very clear 
uh, you know, uh, there is a definition you can you can look it up in uh, some of the mathematics texts about in terms of correlation function. But I would say that as far as uh, the stock is concerned, if the mixing is exponential in time, then it's equivalent to being a Kolmogorov system, which is a positive Lyapunov exponent. So, um, so that's how I'm going to just take Kolmogorov as, and in fact, the systems which we are going to discuss, let me just come down. The systems which we are going to discuss are going to be uh, exponentially decaying uh, in, in time in terms of the correlations. Okay. Uh, uh, and then at the apex of this hierarchy is Bernoulli systems. And here there are ref restrictions on F and G, but it says that there are partitions of phase space such that if you take these functions as residing in these partitions of phase space, these correlations decay instantly. Uh, so we have in mind a discrete time system. So for all time greater than zero, it's, it's just uh, vanishing. So there is, so that's why it's a Bernoulli, it's like a Bernoulli random process, like a coin toss, uh, that there is no correlation from one time to another time at all, not even exponentially small. So, uh, so uh, there are these dynamical systems, simple one, uh, the Baker's map is a famous example of a Bernoulli system. So in this case, you just take a unit square here, that's your phase space, and you stretch it by a factor of two, compress it by a factor of two so that it's area preserving. You cut it in half and put it on top. So that's what a baker is doing when they are kneading dough. And uh, so that's why the picture of bread in there. So this is from a Wikipedia or a Scholarpedia page on uh, Baker's map, uh, on actually the quantum Baker's map. But you can see that the left half of it is stretched and put down here the right half of it is stretched and put up here. And then you continue doing this. And this leads to mixing exactly in that sense, but it's also Kolmogorov. It's got a Lyapunov exponent of log two. It's also Bernoulli in the sense that if you take partitions, so these two vertical partitions, they are actually a Bernoulli partition. And these partitions come out here and you can actually combine these two partitions, it will be four squares. And if you take time further, they will be partitioning phase space finer and finer. And as long as this F and G are characteristic functions on these uh, atoms of these partitions, they will decay instantly. So, uh, so the uh, consequence in terms of dynamics is that the dynamics is a left shift on symbolics, on, on symbols, and we say that there is symbolic dynamics, which is uh, a left shift. So it's a, it's a most sort of uh, random process that a deterministic system can have. Okay, so as far as we are concerned, if a correlation function decays instantly to zero, we would call it Bernoulli. So now I'm going to change tack. Um, um, yeah, so about half an hour, I think, all right? Uh, so I'm just going to switch tacks now to, uh, uh, to talk about quantum systems, which would have also this kind of an hierarchy. And, uh, and interestingly, there's been several models on quantum chaos as an old subject. Uh, and, uh, uh, but interestingly, recently, there has been a lot of work with many body systems and models of many body quantum chaos. And one of them is these random unitary circuits with which my talk is sort of connected. So I thought I'd bring that up. And then there is this nice motivation so the random unitary circuits are basically just connections of let's say qubits just to fix our mind. So we have a collection of qubits, uh, let's say for, for example, in this array here, uh, each of these crosses is a qubit and uh, these things here, these blue are connections between these qubits or interactions between these neighboring qubits. Okay, and uh, what is random about it would be like for instance, uh, each of these, uh, uh, so we, we would think of each of these qubits as actually having an unitary operator on these things. So we, we have an operator sitting where this qubit is and acting on a qubit if you, if you want. Okay, so these are actually unitary operators sitting on this, 
or you can act with unitary operators on these qubits. So, uh, and these interactions would then be two qubit operations. Okay, and the choice of the unitaries which you uh, choose to act on with on these unit on these uh, qubits are themselves random. So these are models of non-integrable quantum many-body systems, uh, and they uh, they are they actually provide so-called uh, unitary K designs. So one of the difficult things about uh, uh, about uh, uh, a random quantum system is actually to sample a random state. So, uh, 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 or in an another context is to actually construct unitary operators, which are themselves picked just uniformly at random from the set of unitary operators. So suppose you have n qubits, the space is two power n dimensional, and uh, you have unitary operators on this two power n dimensional space from which you want to sample uniformly or according to the hard measure. This is a difficult task to do. And so these K designs are intermediate uh, uh, things in which up to K moments of this hard measure is satisfied, okay? Uh, so th that means that although you have only nearest neighbor interactions and so on, it is as if it's creating a very complex many body uh, 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 unitary operator. Uh, so uh, these random unitary circuits provide such a, such a thing. So the, the, the circuits are, uh, so networks of unitary operators, which are evolved with time. So, so, so you can build on time here. So this is uh, an experiment from uh, Google's uh, quantum supremacy experiment, which made uh, a splash uh, uh, so quite, quite you know, recently because they claimed that there was quantum supremacy or classical supercomputers. So what they were basically doing is they were initializing the states of qubits to be zero and they were running it through this random unitary circuit and then they were measuring the state of qubits after some time or depth for them is, 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 is the time essentially. And, uh, and, and then they were looking at distributions of these outcomes. And uh, the uh, claim was that uh, they, could, they could get the uh, desired distribution, which was uh, really exponential uh, in, in time scales, which were uh, inaccessible classically because you need to do, you need to, it needed to evolve a 50, three qubit uh, system. Uh, so uh, what, what we are going to talk about is a sort of random circuits, but they're also special random circuits. And these are dual unitary circuits where introduced, uh, 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 introduced as dual unitary circuits, I think perhaps in terms of terminology for the first time in this paper, by Bertini, Koch and Croson again in 2019, which is exact correlation functions for dual unitary lattice models in one plus one dimension. So there is a prehistory to this. So there are several groups, um, uh, Thomas Gore's group and uh, others group, other, other groups, and including this recent paper who have contributed to this. So it's, it's actually in terms of dual uh, unitary circuits. And I think it's a, a sort of a growing interest in this. And I'll tell you why that is the case. So these are some special types of unitary circuits. So just to set this up, a bit of a background. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna use terminology or notation, which is very similar to that of random, uh, I'm sorry, uh, tensor, uh, tensor network kind of thing. So I'm just going to draw for a unitary operator U, which I'm now going to just think of as a two qubit unitary operator, by the way, I'm going to free myself from qubits. So it's going to be any q, q, small q here is the dimensionality of a single particle Hilbert space, okay? And uh, uh, this unitary is a two qubit unitary. So that's our interaction. So it's a kind of an uh, brick with which we are going to build the circuit. So, uh, so this is the basic two qubit uh, or two qubit operator. And that's just represented by this. So you, you would read these as the legs would be the states J beta as your input. And uh, the output is I alpha, if you wish. And that's the unitary operator. It's a joint is a, by a different color. Here it's red. Otherwise it's the same thing. 
So for instance, the equation u, u at joint is identity because of u is unitarity is simply given by contracting these two indices. And then you have an identity, which is just a wire, which is not connected, uh, which is just short, short circuited. Okay, so that's the, that's the identity here, delta ij, delta alpha beta. So it just disappears. So as long when, when you just contract these two, basically these unitary operators disappear and can be replaced by this. So similarly here, there is u at joint u, we read from down to top. So time runs from time, if you wish, when, when I think about this as u at joint as time one and u at time two or something, it runs from uh, bottom to top, down to up. Okay. Uh, and uh, the tensor product of several such things is just putting them all together. So here is an eight particle uh, operators in which you have just two of them, neighboring operators, or, or four pairs of them. So to build up this circuit, uh, we just have nearest neighbor interactions amongst eight of them in this example, which I've given, in which first the, uh, the uh, uh, odd even pairs are connected. So one, two, three, four, et cetera, but there is no in uh, interaction between two, three, and so on, which happens at the next level. So this is at the next level, there is interaction between two, three, four, five, and so on. And uh, the whole dynamics is just given by this nearest neighbor interactions. Okay, so this is a Floquet model uh, of, uh, uh, so it's a Floquet model because it's basic uh, ingredient is a unitary operator. Okay, and uh, we'll put periodic boundary conditions so that we are connecting up this to this so that there is, boundary conditions here, which is uh, uh, cylindrical. So we would think of this itself as the unitary operator for the eight particle system. So that is this big U. So this is, this is the uh, individual uh, two qubit unitaries or two qubit unitaries. And this is the shifted lattice here. T is just the shift operator. And that's the dynamics. So this is the dynamics on 2L particles. And we'd be interested in iterating this. So u to the power of t, what happens in this? So here is an example of t is three. So there are three layers which we have put here. Uh, so let's say that you want to calculate trace of u power t. And uh, then the picture is exactly this. I've taken this from that PRL paper I think of uh, Bertini and, and uh, Koch and Prosen. So, uh, uh, so this is a three layer thing. So here there is uh, uh, 10 particles and, uh, uh, and uh, the contractions are given by these joinings here. And because of periodic boundary conditions, it's on a, uh, it's uh, the left and right are joined. And this trace operation in time also implies contraction of the top legs with the bottom legs. So that's what the trace does. So the whole thing is just a diagrammatic way of calculating this powers of this propagator, trace of the powers of the propagator. Uh, but uh, drawing it like this kind of tells us another way of viewing the same thing that instead of so here the time is running from down to up and position from left to right. But we can think about it in another way as if the time is running from left to right and position is running from bottom to top. Because you see the entire thing is kind of, we can just rotate our viewpoint by 90 degrees. And we can think about these as the contractions. But when we do that, this, we are changing space, space and time's roles, and we will get this as a trace of some u tilde to the power of L, where u tilde is a kind of a rotated u. Rotated meaning not in the actual sense of rotation, but some kind of a permutation, which I will come to in more detail. Okay, but the important thing is that we can calculate this trace u to the power of t as a trace u tilde to the power of L, where this L is the spatial Dimension. So there are two L particles, propagator is U and time is T, that's the usual case, is equivalent to two T particles and propagator is U tilde and time is L. 
So they are, they are conjugate to each other. So this is some, this kind of in statistical mechanics when we do uh, partition function and transfer operator, it's, it's, it's very similar to that. But in general, this U tilde is not unitary. Uh, so we are interested in cases where it is unitary and those are actually the so-called dual unity. So dual unitaries are cases in which this unitary U is special and this U tilde is itself unitary. So uh, what that means is actually if you contract indices, not just vertically, but also horizontally in a way that also remains unitary. Okay, so U is dual unitary if it has this contraction of the legs. You see, so the usual contraction is I would contract this with this and this with this, but in, now we are contracting on the same side here. And uh, this also is identity. And we can also do it on the other side and that is this. So what was not realized is that actually this dual unitary is very closely connected to the fact something about it, say something about the entanglement of this unitary U. And that's rather easy to see actually. If you write it out in terms of uh, indices, you see that this condition of, uh, 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 this condition of dual unitarity is equivalent to the realignment of this unitary U being also unitary. And what do I mean by realignment? A realignment is just concentrate on this leg here, this uh, segment here. Let me see if I can, somehow I seem to have lost my ability to scribble on, on this. So I'm sorry. So if you just uh, take a look at this I1 alpha one U I2 alpha two, that's equal to I1 I2 U R2 alpha one alpha two. So this is the definition of U R2. It just comes from interchanging the indices, the, uh, the, the uh, entries alpha one and I2. Okay, so it's a bipartite system which we have in mind, but now there is this slightly crazy operation which is sort of similar to partial transpose, but not quite. So that is the realignment of this. And uh, this condition simply says that the realignment is also unitary. So you can just think of realignment as a sum permutation of the unitary matrix elements, and that permutation also is unitary. And uh, this has an implication that the operator Schmidt decomposition is flat. So you can take an operator and just as you would do for a bipartite state, you can do an operator, you can do a Schmidt decomposition of it in terms of operator basis. In that case, the, eigen, the, the Schmidt values are simply coming from the singular values of this realigned operator. So that's really the meaning of this uh, realigned operator. The significance of it is just the spectrum of this. And if this is unitary, then this is simply one. And so that implies that this spectrum is all one. And so that's like the Bell states of operators. Okay, so a dual unitary then also really implies that U has a maximum operator in time. So what does this, uh, what does this lead to? Uh, so the, uh, what, what this leads to, uh, what was actually uh, discussed by these people is that the correlation functions are uh, easy to calculate, become easy to calculate. So let's come back to our friend, the correlation function for which we had some discussions, but now this F and G are in terms of operators. So we have here an operator which is localized on the single particle, A, I, A Y, I. Y is the, I, I is uh, representing the, uh, uh, the uh, which of the operators you're, you're choosing. You can take an operator basis. So I've taken some operator basis and uh, Y is the position of this operator. And you take another operator, single particle operator at X, and then you evolve this operator with time. A, I, Y with time, that gives you this Heisenberg evolution. And the other operator is remaining constant in time. And the average is now the trace. The average over phase space is replaced by the trace operation. So this is exactly that. I'm not subtracting out the uncorrelated versions uh, because I'm assuming that the traces are zero. So you can look at it and this is sufficient to consider that the trace, traceless operators 
are sufficient to consider here. Professor Lakshminarayan, uh, yeah. we have a question from Ihor. Yes, uh, regarding the uh, previous slide, I'm a bit confused. Uh, doesn't the fact that an uh, operator has the maximal uh, operator entanglement entropy means that uh, this operator is identity matrix or identity uh, operator? Yeah. Can this uh, U be not trivial if uh, yeah if all the Schmidt values are ones or oh, well the same? Uh, say that again. What's the question? So, to me, it seems that if all the Schmidt values are the same, the operator is just identity. It seems that identity. No, no, no. No, no the, the, I mean, the unitary operator U is not identity. It's, it's this, this AIs are not uh, trivial. Uh, they are, uh, uh, they are coming from, uh, I mean, uh, they are, uh, they can be anything. So uh, it, these are themselves operator bases. Yeah, but uh, the, the Schmidt values don't depend on the choice of the uh, bases, right? And it seems no. to me that identity matrix maximizes uh, operator entanglement, uh, and it's the isn't it the only matrix? Well, the only operators that maximize. No, no, uh, no. They, uh, you're, you're talking about U as the identity itself. U as the identity is not a uh, not not entangled at all, uh, because you can just write it as a product of two uh, identities. Mm -hmm. ah, I see. Yes, 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 yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I, I will come to some examples of dual operators and uh, uh, that. Okay, so it's in fact a task to construct. Okay, so here is the a circuit to calculate this quantity, which is the correlation function. Okay, so now this correlation function, this F and G are taken up by this. Now this is really a space time thing. So there is also space that is in terms of X and Y and uh, separated by time t. Okay, so we need to evaluate this diagram. And now we start doing contractions because this is a unitary operator here like this. So this is U, U adjoint, and then they just go away and so on. So you can start doing contractions. And what you will get is a picture like this. This is again from that paper. Uh, so you get a picture like this, where you see the so-called light cone here. And these are the operators which you began with. There's a slightly different notation and colors between ours and theirs. So this is from their, uh, I've just taken it from their thing for convenience. So you can see the two operators here. And this operator is inside the light cone of this operator here. What they showed was that the correlations vanish inside the light cone. All correlations vanish inside the light cone if the operator U, the two particle operators are dual unitary. So this is what they showed. This is just coming from unitarity, but you can do further contractions because it's a dual unitary, like what happens here, and then further simplifications happen and you get zero. So as long as the two operators are inside or you fix one operator, the other one is inside its light cone, then the correlation between them vanishes. So this was shown by them and then they also showed, therefore, that the only uh, non-trivial correlation... Excuse me, uh, uh, we have a question from Dario. Uh, yeah, thanks. Can you go to the previous slide? Uh, sorry, is it a bit counterintuitive, right? That if they are uh, in, this, in the light cone, uh, they are uncorrelated. So can you give a, an intuitive reason why? I mean, okay, diagrammatically, I see, fine. But uh, can you give an intuitive uh, reason why? I mean, I would say that if they are in the light cone, they tend to, let's say, overlap at late time. So it's a bit counterintuitive. Uh, so okay. do you have so any you're, you're, you're asking kind of a qualitative question. Let me just try to answer that as best as I can. If you have something which is not chaotic at all, right, or, or not ergodic or chaotic and let's have that in mind, okay? Something like as trivial as some identity operator, okay? okay? Is interactions. Then you would have something in which there is correlation exactly at the x equal to zero line. You would have correlations inside the light cone. And okay. in fact, when you have 
localization, many body localization and so on. You would have, you would expect correlations inside the light cone here. Okay. So this, this is actually the opposite of that. When you have complete delocalization and so on, and then you would have only correlations on the light cone. So this is the maximum velocity uh, uh, case, mm. as a matter of fact. So all you have is, uh, is this is the, the information is traveling at maximum possible speed. The inside, all of them are already decorrelated. Ah, wait, 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 I see. Uh, because here you are computing the core IC. Okay, so essentially, okay, let me see if I understand. You are saying, of course, outside of the light cone, you cannot have correlation because they don't talk to each other. Inside, they could have in principle, but they already decorrelated. So the only place where you can have correlation is exactly at the light cone. Yeah. I see. Okay, got it. Thanks. So that's actually coming because those unitary U's are maximally entangled. That's okay. Sure, or, sure. or operator entanglement is, is, is large. So can you quantify, let's say, maximal chaos, not, not maximal chaos, by how far you can go inside the light cone and you still see correlation? Uh, I, I will be doing some of that, but actually I won't be going inside the light cone at all in this talk. I see. But I will be, I will be quantifying. That's, that's, part of, that, that's really the core, the core of my talk. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks. Uh, till then, uh, may I ask how much more time I have? Um, I mean, we had uh, several questions and discussions. I think 15 minutes uh, okay. should still. OK, I try. So, uh, uh, so we have correlations only on the light cone. And what is interesting is that the correlations on the light cone can be found explicitly. And that's what is interesting. So the non-zero correlations. So you look at this diagram, which has a kind of, uh, let's see, and you notice that there's a nested structure. You notice that uh, the, uh, if I was to replace this operator, so this, this operator A beta is sitting inside, but suppose we replace this entire uh, circuit or entire uh, set by a, an effective operator, it looks exactly like the, now it looks like the exact operator outside. So you can just go in this nested way so to calculate this, all we need to do is calculate this, uh, the, the effect of this uh, inside circuit here. And please, there's a change in color because this is ours and that's just stolen from the paper. So this one here, this is the lower one is this and the upper one is this. So uh, what we can think about this, actually this correlation is exactly equal to the trace of this object raised to the power of 2t, where t is the time, and uh, this a alpha is this lone operator which is sitting there. And what is this operation inside? This takes you from a single operator, a beta, it maps it into another operator. Okay, so it's a map from operators to operators, and it is in fact, so that map is represented as m plus, so you iterate this map 2t times with the input as a beta, you get some operator and you find the correlation of that with a alpha. So that's the value of the correlation along the light cone. And this map is a CPTP map, a completely positive trace preserving map of open quantum systems. And they determine the DKF correlations along the light cone. And uh, so uh, this M plus map, which I have here is explicitly written. So now we can just think about it as two operate as two unitary, I'm sorry, two qubit or two particle operate uh, channels and forget about the circuit. So uh, this is just a single operator sigma and this U is a two particle operator. And uh, now you can compute the action of this and trace out one. And that's the definition of the uh, of this channel M, M plus. Okay, so that is exactly what is written inside here. So in the open quantum systems case, usually there's a system and an environment and the environment could be in a most mixed state and we trace out the environment. Here it's somewhat different. We trace out the system. Okay, so that's what, what happens. M minus is another map, which is relevant to the circuit. Uh, where actually this operator a beta sits on this leg here to the uh, to the right of this okay 
um, in, 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 in which case there is correlations along this light cone segment. So that is the uh, another uh, channel uh, which is relevant to the circuit. And that's just given by this. So the identity is on the first system, but you're still tracing out the, uh, uh, the subsystem in which the operator sigma is sitting. Okay, so these are the channels or maps which then determine the decay of correlations and all the eigenvalues of the CPTP map determine now the rates of decay. So the spectrum of these CPTP maps, we represent as this lambda j and there are q squared of such eigenvalues because uh, q remember is the dimensionality of the single particle system. The operator space is therefore q squared dimensional and uh, therefore the map is on a q squared dimensional uh, 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 linear operator and there are q squared eigenvalues. And uh, it's a unital map, which means that it preserves identity. And therefore it's actually, uh, there is a trivial eigenvalue which corresponds to one. It's like some Markov process. And this is lambda zero plus minus one. So each of these plus minus one maps, there is a eigenvalue equal to one, which is a trivial operator, trivial eigenvalue rather. Okay, and the non-trivial eigenvalues all lie uh, inside or on the unit circle. Okay, so we arrange them in a decreasing order in which lambda one is the largest. And they completely determine correlation functions because of the linearity. So the correlation functions are just these eigenvalues raised to the power of 2t. So if, so we can define these kind of, so there was ergodic classification of the circuits done, which is that if all the eigenvalues of the channels are equal to one, then the correlations remain constant in all modes. The system is non-interacting. So if any one of the mode eigenvalues is equal to one, that mode will not decay for sure, but it will also not average out to zero. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's non-ergodic. So it will be still non-ergodic if there are several eigenvalues which are equal to one. Okay, then the correlations in these K modes will remain constant, will not average out to zero, therefore it's non-ergodic. If it is, it's ergodic, if none of the eigenvalues is equal to one, but there exists and it, but it is not mixing. If at least one of the eigenvalues is a modulus equal to one. Okay, in which case the average will, I mean, the, uh, the average will be still zero because none of the eigenvalues is equal to one. However, it's non-mixing because this, uh, this eigenvalue is equal to one, it will not decay to zero without the average. And it's ergodic and mixing if all the eigenvalues, non-trivial eigenvalues are strictly less than one, in which case the correlations decay exponentially. To this, we added this, uh, uh, this apex, which is that all non-trivial eigenvalues vanish exactly equal to zero. Then the correlations instantly decay. Okay, so we showed that this is actually possible. So, uh, so we'll take a closer look at what these maps are, uh, just as uh, the realignment played an important role, the partial transpose actually plays an important role in the channel case. So one can show quite easily that the, the map M plus is just given by the partial transpose or of the unitary operator uh, by this manner. So this is a positive operator. It's called the dynamical matrix corresponding to this map. You partial transpose, the partial transpose are joined and this is a realignment, just as what we see. So it's interesting that this uh, channel is represented, the partial transpose of the operator comes into play here. So what we found was that the dual operators by definition are where the realignment is unitary. Okay, uh, but the partial transpose of the unitary determines the channel and the decay rates. Okay, so the other channel is also related to this, just it's uh, very closely related to this. Uh, so, uh, so now we can ask the following question. What happens? Is it possible that this unitary operator's partial transpose is also unitary? Okay, uh, so in, in that case, 
we'll see what are the consequences of that. So the partial transpose is also unitary. So there are some further contractions of this is also identity. So what is interesting is that this implies that the circuit channels are completely depolarizing. Whatever operator you may put inside, you get out identity or the most mixed state. So it, that's why it's completely polarizing channel. And, uh, and this uh, channel then can be written as just a one dimensional uh, projector uh, with this phi plus being the most entangled state, two qubit or two qubit most entangled state here. So since these are the channel themselves, it is clear that it's a one dimensional projector. All the eigenvalues are zero, except the trivial eigenvalue, which is one, which corresponds to the eigenvector phi plus. So indeed, in this case, this is what results in a Bernoulli circuit because all the eigenvalues are exactly equal to zero. So for there to be a Bernoulli circuit in which there are not even correlations along the light cone, so correlations vanish everywhere, it's possible that happens when you have not only duality, but also what we call T-duality, wherein the partial transpose is also unitary. Uh, is it possible, first of all, to have such operator? It turns out that it is not possible for qubits. It's not possible for qubits. It is known, it's an open problem for Q equals six, but for every other local dimension, it's explicitly constructed set of uh, for which it's known that such operators exist. They have been called in the literature as two unitary operators, and they are related to constructions of many particle states called absolutely maximally entangled states. And they are also called perfect tensors in the tensor network community. So in short- Professor uh, Lakshminarayan, uh, there yeah. is a question from Dario. I believe yeah, is a, is a trivial question, but what is special about Q equal to six? Uh, oh, <laughs> Q equal six I mean, no, is is actually very special because uh, uh, it, it, I mean the MUB problem, the mutually unbiased problem, is not known. But just to answer your question, uh, Q equals six uh, uh, is special because of the interesting thing is for every other dimension, the construction is via permutation matrices which are constructed from orthogonal Latin squares. Okay. You know? And orthogonal Latin squares don't exist in two, which is a trivial statement, and also in six, which is a non-trivial statement. I see. So I see. people don't know whether it exists or not. It's an open problem in quantum information. I see, I see. Okay, okay. So uh, let's say it's not something that you realize at the end. I mean, you could guess from the very beginning that Q equal to six was special for this property, given this property, I see. I can't, okay. I could not have. Uh, yeah, so, but there it does exist Bernoulli circuits for Q trails, Q quads and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, so you can, you can look up, there are connections to all of these uh, uh, quantum information sense. But what is also interesting, let me quickly point out, is that if, if the circuit is Bernoulli, not only single particle correlations vanish, which was what Rosen's work was all about. They were talking really about single particle correlations. It's an open problem, really, what happens to many particle correlations or you know, when, when the observable is over many particles. But for two particle observables, the Bernoulli circuits also vanish, exactly. the correlations vanish exactly. That's seen quite easily from this. I wouldn't go into this details. Okay, so two particle observables also decorrelate instantaneously, but not three particles and above. So this is somewhat like the Bernoulli partitions of classical mechanics, where not everything will decay instantly, but there are partitions such that the decay happens instantly. Okay, so here is uh, the core of my talk really, but I think I'm quite out of time. But this is what, I, uh, is, is what we showed, is that uh, the, uh, the quantity, which is very, uh, plays a crucial role then in the life of a dual unitary circuit, is the so-called entangling power of the two, of the uh, interaction unitary or the brick unitary U. And we showed that if this entangling power, and this entangling power has a range between zero and one under some proper normalizations, zero is an, a uh, non-entangling operator. One is a maximally entangling operator in some sense, okay? Uh, 
Uh, and uh, for dual operators, the entangling power can go all the way from zero to one. Okay, so they, uh, let me remind you that the, it may be a bit confusing that I said that the dual operators are, operator entanglement is maximum, but that does not imply that the entangling power is maximum. Okay, so the swap operator with just switches to particles is something which does not entangle at all, but it is very non-local and it is having maximum operator entanglement. So it is actually something which is dual, but it has zero entangling power. And if your circuit is based on that or on local operations on the swap, then it is non-mixing. But if the entangling power is uh, anything up to EP star, where this EP star deter is, is determined just from the local dimension Q, it can be mixing. Okay, and what we showed was that if it exceeds this EP star, uh, it is definitely mixing. It's definitely mixing. And if this entangling power is equal to one, which is a maximum possible, it is the case of a Bernoulli circuit. And for qubits, as I said, it's not possible to have two unitaries, which means actually that this entangling power cannot exceed this two by three. But for qubits, for greater than qubits, it's possible and you can reach this Bernoulli limit. Tillen, let me ask you again uh, about my remaining time because based on that, I will uh, choose my future slides. Uh, five minutes, is okay. that okay? Okay, uh, so, so, uh, so I, I think I need to just define an entangling power maybe Briefly, what is an entangling power is simple. So you take a two unitary, of, uh, I mean, a, a bipartite unitary U, act on with product states and find out some entanglement measure of that, average over this hard measure of product states, okay? And you can normalize by some constant, that's the entangling power. If this entanglement measure is the purity, is the so-called linear entropy, which is based on the purity, which is what we will use. It was called as an entangling power by Zanardi and uh, et al. Sorry, I didn't put the reference as early as 2001. Okay, and that's what we are calling EP of U. That's the entangling power. So this is related. If it is a linear entropy, it's related to operator entanglements of U and operator entanglement of US, where this uh, S is the swap operator. So the swap operator, as I said, has a maximum operator entanglement and that's given by this one minus one over K squared. So, okay, so it's, there is connection to operator entanglements and this operator entanglements are themselves related to realignment and partial transpose. So this is the operator entanglement of this unitary operator U written in terms of the realignment operation. And this is a maximum E of S if U is dual, because remember, if U is dual, UR is actually a, uh, unitary itself. But what is interesting is that this other quantity, EUS, is also a maximum if it is a two unitary, because the partial transpose to which it is related is also unitary. Okay, so, uh, so that's the connection. So EP of U is one if and only if the unitary U is two unitary or a perfect tensor. So that's the definition of unitary operator. And uh, maybe I will skip this thing about how to construct dual unitaries and two unitary operators. Uh, uh, there, it's, it's, there are several constructions based on, actually there aren't that many, it's just people are now discovering how to find these things. So they're based on some unitary blocks and swap combinations, permutations, as I told you, which are related to orthogonal Latin squares, cat maps, something which we found, and some other people have also discussed before, Fourier transforms, complex Hadamard matrix based things, and also nonlinear maps on the space of unitary operators. So we had this paper uh, last year about how to construct ensembles of these dual unitary operators uh, using a nonlinear map on the thing. It produces highly uh, operators with large entangling power, but it's, uh, it's also a numerical algorithm. Okay, uh, so for, for qubits, the situation is simple. As I said, there, is, there are no two unitaries or perfect tensors. 
but it's simple in the sense that there exists an explicit construction. So these parameterize all dual operators. So it's just like an XX X, uh, uh, interaction uh, in which two of them are this pi by four and the other one is J. J equals zero gives you something in which the entangling power is a maximum. J equals pi by four is really a swap operator. So the entangling power can be related just to this thing here. So let me not uh, spend time on this. So there are further constructions. So here, I, interesting thing from a cat map, which I showed you first as a classical thing, but now we can take two such cat maps and sort of intertwine them and quantize it and get a unitary operator U. And what is interesting is that when this dimensionality Q is even, it gives you a, a operator which is a dual, but it's not maximally entangling, uh, okay? so. Uh, so it's not it, it's it's not a two unit. Uh, so, but it's equal to this EP star which I defined earlier. But if Q is odd, like three, like like for Q trits, this is actually a two unit. So it provides an explicit construction of Bernoulli circuits using such things. Okay, so I think I should actually uh, skip this, which is one of the main parts of our thing. Is what we found was Oh, we took dual unitary circuits and took random single particle unitary operators. Uh, and we found the average of these quantities uh, uh, average over these single particles because the single particle uh, unitary such as these don't affect the fact that it's a dual operator. Okay, so the dual operator content is not changed if we take this two unitary and act on local fields. However, the channels change. The eigenvalues of the channels are not invariant under these local things. So they enable us to define single particle average quantities. And these are actually the eigenvalues of these, uh, 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 of these channels uh, with different single particle uh, unitaries. And these are given as a function of this entangling power of this unitary U. This is for the case of Q trips. And there are four entangling powers. This is from the smallest, and this is the sort of the largest in this four. And what is plotted in this blue is the largest eigenvalue, lambda one. This is the smallest eigenvalue, okay? Uh, and uh, the, you can, there is a circle plotted here, which is square root of one minus the entangling power. And remarkably, it fits the largest eigenvalue. So what we, let me skip then, uh, I think most of these things, but we define things like a spectral gap, mixing rates, and so on. And what we, uh, let me also skip this, maybe just come to this. So the case of uh, local dimension greater than two, not qubits, but for greater than that, we looked at the largest eigenvalue of the uh, channel, averaged it out over single particle unitaries, Okay, so that gives us a global picture of sort of how much mixing the system is. And, uh, and uh, if it is zero, that is actually a two unitary operator. We plot that versus the entangling power. The entangling power does not change with the local unitaries. It's a local unitary invariant. Okay, so it's well-defined quantity independent of this average. What is remarkable is that they all fall on one curve, whether it is local dimension three, four, five, or six, or where these uh, operators are coming from and so on. So there is a universality which arises in this. And it tells you that the larger the entangling power is, the more mixing the system is in a sort of one-to-one -one way. So that's what is interesting. And this is what we showed analytically. That it's possible to do some hard average to show, to prove that the average a uh, largest eigenvalue modulus of that is in fact square root of one minus the entangling power. Okay, uh, so we have some more results, but uh, let me not uh, go into that. And also we showed how as this entangling power grows, increases from zero to one, you can say several things about the circuit. Uh, so if this entangling power is greater than this EP star, as I said, all the eigenvalues are less than one because the largest eigenvalue itself is less than one. 
But if this entangling power is just positive, the smallest eigenvalue is guaranteed to be less than one. And if it is more than one by Q square minus one, the smallest two are guaranteed to be less than one and so on. So there is actually a hierarchy of uh, mixing that happens as the entangling power grows from zero to one. And so this entangling power is sort of organizing the chaos or the non-integrability in the circuit. So that's, that's what our uh, thing is, I will skip that. And so the summary is that we have defined Bernoulli circuits as being constructed from two unitaries as the apex of a quantum ergodic hierarchy. And the entangling power of the two particle building blocks constructs a hi the, this hierarchy. And for entangling power greater than a critical value, which depends simply on the local dimension, the circuit is definitely mixing. So it's a sufficiency condition. And if it is equal to one, and actually if and only if it's equal to one, it is Bernoulli. The local average spectral gap, average mixing rates, et cetera, are universal functions for greater than two. And they depend, this average is just approximately equal to this. And for qubits also, we have exact results. Uh, they are special though. So we have some exact results for them. There are several uh, questions, of course. Uh, um, just a few here. What happens to non-dual circuits is very important, like uh, uh, finite circuits. So this is really assuming that time is going to infinity or you know we are always on this light cone or uh, it's well-defined, but there would be recurrences in finite uh, circuits. Um, so that would be really interesting. Connections with standard quantum chaos measures and physical models of Bernoulli circuits like qubits Kicked icing models are supposed to perf uh, give you such dual circuits, but they are not Bernoulli because they are just qubits. Uh, but we have some examples based on a cat map, which I think can be also implemented because it's basically like a Fourier transform. Uh, so, but still, it would be nice to have physical models which are actually Bernoulli. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop with that. This is a somewhat difficult graph to explain, but it's basically entangling power here is another local unitary invariant. The dual operators lie on this one line here. And this is the apex is the two unit theory. But actually there's a whole lot of things happening here and that would be involving more than the entangling power. It would be interesting to see what sort of things happen there. So thank you for your attention and great questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Lakshminarayan for this uh, very nice talk. Let's uh, thank our speaker. So we have uh, some time for a uh, few questions. Uh, uh, Ihor, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, maybe a bit of a general question. So the construction, the initial construction of the uh, circuits uh, remind a lot of uh, Suzuki trotter decomposition for Hamiltonian evolution. Right. So uh, there is a certain mapping, I guess. So uh, is it possible to say something about the class of Hamiltonians that lead to dual circuits in this term, uh, terms? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it's also related to this physical models that one is talking about. So there is this uh, uh, class of works by uh, Thomas Gour. Who, who actually construct these kind of uh, dual uh, circuits uh, based on kicked uh, Hamiltonian. So they actually start with an Hamiltonian and then kick it. So, uh, so it is possible. So if you look at some of these papers with this kicked icing spin chain, and uh, also I think, uh, yeah, this uh, physical review B paper, which is more recent, uh, exact correlations in kicked chains you would, you would find uh, that it's, it's actually a fluke Hamiltonian and then from there you get these things. And uh, you can have some conditions on the potential so that it, it leads to dual unitarity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see, thank you. Do we have uh, any further questions?
Uh, it seems not. So in this case, uh, let us thank uh, Professor Lakshmi Narayan again. Uh, uh, so with this, uh, we conclude uh, today's seminar. Uh, so. Uh, let us take a five minute break and then uh, whoever is interested in discussing uh, just stay online so thank you all thank you very much